Welcome to Quantum Mechanics, a powerful framework for understanding the universe. Hi everyone. Today we're going to talk about self-adjoint operators and eigenvalues and eigenvectors. This is a really important topic in quantum mechanics, and so I'm going to break it up into two lectures. This is the first one, and I'll give another one later on. Okay. So in order to talk about self-adjoint operators, we need to first talk about the adjoint of an operator. Okay, so definition 13 or 15 is extremely important to pay close attention to and get your head around. So the setting is let V be a vec vector space complex with an inner product, and we're going to consider a linear operator A mapping V into V. We want it to be a bounded linear operator, and you can check later on why that might be the case and why that could mess up the definition. Okay, you can view this as an equation for the adjoint. It's an equation in terms of the inner product. So look at the right-hand side first. We have the inner product of a phi with psi. And that's equal to the inner product of phi with this operator we call a dagger psi, and that is the adjoint. And that must hold for every vector, phi and psi, in the vector space. Okay? So everything is known in this problem except for a dagger, and this defines a dagger, the adjoint. Now we saw last time that if we have a basis, Computing the matrix representation of an operator in that basis can be very useful. It can help us to actually do calculations of how the operator acts on specific vectors. So what we want to do now is compute the matrix representation of the adjoint. Okay, so look at equation 123. This is just the definition of the adjoint. But what do I want what I want to do is to swap around the middle look at the middle term in this in these um, three terms in the equations. And the right hand side is just swapping around those two terms. We have psi on the left, a phi on the right, this term here. Okay. That uses the property of the inner product, and I told you, you need to, to be careful because when you swap terms around in the inner product, you get this bar over the top, the complex conjugate, and that's really important. Okay, now, with that relationship, let's consider an orthonormal basis, E1 through En, on our vector space. So it's going to be finite dimensional in this case, for this argument. Alright, in that case, remember that AJK the matrix elements are EJ in a product with A dagger EK. But we can swap them around using the relation above. We get, an, we get a, a complex conjugate on top, and that is nothing more than AKJ with a complex conjugate on top. So what this tells us is that the matrix elements of the adjoint of an operator is a transpose of that operator along with taking the complex conjugate of every element in the matrix when we take the transpose. Okay. Now, doing these types of calculations is pretty important because you know, I warned you that you're going to be using these properties of the inner product over and over and that's what we just use here. Okay, now here's another property that you can prove of the adjoint. That the adjoint of the inverse is the inverse of the adjoint. It's easy to say, but uh, what does it mean? Okay, let's look at this. We're looking at the, in the adjoint of the inverse, and we just plug this in 
and we start doing the calculations. We bring the adjoint over, and then we multiply by the unit vector. A time um, a dagger, a dagger inverse. We bring this back over to the left, and lo and behold, we end up with on the right a dagger inverse. Okay. Now, I did this very fast, but this I want you to go through and think about it. Think about all the, the pieces of the calculation and how you ended up with this. So this is typical of, of these arguments with the adjoint and the inner product. Okay, We prove it for arbitrary vectors, phi and psi, and then we show that, well, that, that uh, if it holds for any vector, then it must hold for this particular operator. Now we get to the real quantum mechanical aspect that we're looking for in this definition of a self-adjoint or Hermitian operator. Now I hate to bring into play this, this uh, phrase Hermitian. Uh, there is a little bit of a tension here because physicists tend to use the word, the, uh, the, fr the um, name Hermitian after Charles Hermite and mathematicians you tend to use self adjoint there is a slight diff there's a difference in infinite dimensions and i've provided the reference in the text for that it tends to be a bit of a technical dif difference um, but for finite dimensions they're exactly the same and so we're not going to worry too much about the difference but just keep this in mind when you read some you're, you're going to when you read the quantum mechanics literature you're going to see both of these terms and the main properties that we use for both self-adjoint and emission operators are pretty much the same. And I'll, once we start deriving these properties, I'll make that clear. So what do you think a self-adjoint operator is? Well, guess, it's an operator where the adjoint is equal to the operator. And that's exactly what that highlighted phrase shows. You know, when I bring the A over to the right or to the left, if it's self-adjoint, I don't have to put the, um, the adjoint sign on it. Okay, now let's look at uh, a simple example. So, we consider C2 and let E1, E2 be a basis, orthonormal basis on C2. Okay, so we, an operator is defined by how it acts on bases. And I give it this definition here. Now we can write down the matrix representation for this operator in this basis, and it's given by this matrix. Wait, did I just skip some steps? Maybe a bit, but I've done this several times, and I want you to uh, go back to the calculations earlier for the matrix elements for the and check that actually this is the matrix representation for the operator defined in this way. Okay, it's self-adjoint if you take the transpose and the complex conjugate of everything and you get the same thing. Now you can do that in your head, I hope. You can see clearly that A equals A transpose with the complex conjugate of every term, which is the adjoint. And it, so it is self, this is an example of a self-adjoint linear operator. There are many identities that we can derive using def the definition of the adjoint that are kind of have a familiar feel from properties for matrices. For example, the adjoint of the product is the product of the adjoints, but you reverse the order. Okay. This is going to be an exercise that we do later on, so I'm not going to spend much more time in that. There's these, but these end, end up being very useful when we look at products of self-adjoint operators, and you'll see why we may do this. Let me finish with this definition, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. I'm just kind of pulling this out. I know you've seen them before in your other courses, but let's, let's consider a... Uh, a linear operator on a vector space V. An eigenvector has the property that if we act on it with A, 
we get it back, but it's just multiplied by a scalar, complex numbers in this case. Okay, so they're just uh, the, the all the linear operator does to an eigenvector is scale it by the scalars that we're concerned with, and that's it. Okay. That's a good place to stop for the moment. The latter part of this section, I want to talk about the main self-adjoint operators. And there are three of them. The position operator, the momentum operator, and the energy operator. Those are things we observed. And their definitions and why they're self-adjoint. But I will bring that up next time. And I hope you've enjoyed this. Think about all the calculations. Think about how it relates to the previous um, lectures that we've had and the material in the book, and you'll be in good shape for what we, what it, we, we are going to encounter next. Bye, everybody.